Welcome to the Deep Doc. Today, uh, we're going deep on this case study from the Veterinary Radiology and Ultrasound Journal. Oh, yeah. About intervertebral disc disease in a horse. Cool. IVDD. Yeah. We're going to unpack this case step by step and see what we can learn. What makes this case so interesting is they used multiple advanced imaging techniques and a post-mortem examination to confirm the diagnosis. So like a multimodal approach. Yeah. Not something you see every day in equine IVDD cases. Right. Let's start with the patient. Okay. What can you tell us about this horse? Mm-hmm. And, uh... And, and what were the symptoms that got this whole investigation started? So it was a three-year-old American saddlebred gelding yep. presented with progressive ataxia. Lack of coordination. Yep, and tetraparesis. Weakness in all four limbs. Yeah, so these symptoms, they all point to some kind of neurological problem, but uh, the challenge was figuring out exactly what was causing it. So you got a horse that's struggling to move properly. Uh-huh. Obviously, neurological signs. So what were the vets thinking it could be at first? Well, the initial diagnoses, there were a few possibilities. Yeah. Like uh, cervical vertebral stenotic myelopathy. Okay. Which is a narrowing of the spinal canal in the neck. Okay. And then also equine protozoal myelitis. A parasitic infection that can affect the spinal cord. Exactly. So they had some possibilities to narrow down. Yeah. How did they start getting a clearer picture? of what was going on inside the horse's spine. So first they took standing lateral cervical spine radiographs. Okay. And those showed a narrowing of the vertebral canal at the C6-7 vertebrae. Okay. Along with some bony changes. Like what? Like a an enlargement of the articular processes. The parts that connect the vertebrae. Right. Interesting. So th the radiographs gave them some clues. Yeah. But they needed more details to really see what was going on. Mm. So what did they do next? They did a radiographic myelography. Which is where they inject a contrast material into the spinal canal and then take x-rays. Yep. Okay. And that showed significant compression of the spinal cord at that same C6-7 vertebrae. Okay. So something was definitely pressing on the cord there. That must have been a really important finding. Yes. But to get even more specific, they did even more imaging, right? Right. They went on to do CT myelography. Which combines a CT scan with the contrast in the spinal canal. Exactly. Okay. And that gave them a much more detailed view, showing circumferential attenuation of the contrast agent around the spinal cord at C6-7. And that means... Severe compression, yeah. That sounds pretty bad for the horse. Yeah, it wasn't looking good. So they were really pulling out all the stops trying to figure out how bad this was. Yeah, they were. And it sounds like the findings were pretty severe? Unfortunately. What happened next? Well, because of how bad the compression was and the poor prognosis, yeah. they decided to euthanize the horse. It's always sad to lose a patient. Yeah. But it does give a chance to really look into what was going on. Right. And they were able to do an MRI of the cervical spine and a full postmortem examination. So what did the MRI and postmortem show? The postmortem MRI confirmed the severe dorsal bulging of the disc material at C67, which was deforming the spinal cord. Yeah. Figure two in the study shows this really well. Okay. It highlights areas of T2 hyperintensity yeah. and T1 isointensity within the spinal cord, indicating damage likely from the compression. We'll have to dive deeper into that in a bit. Okay. But first, what about that macroscopic examination of the spine? So what they could see with their eyes yeah. showed that the intervertebral disc material was protruding into the spinal canal at C6-7, okay. just like the imaging showed. Okay. But they also saw something else that was interesting, osteoarthrosis of the cervical column. Osteoarthritis in the horse's neck. Yeah. Could that be related to this case? It might be. Okay. If the joints are degenerating, it could put stress on the discs and make them more likely to herniate. Yeah. Which shows how everything in the spine is connected. Makes sense. Yeah. So we've talked about the imaging and what they saw during the exam. Right. What did the histological examination of the disc show? They looked at the C67 disc under a microscope, and yeah. it definitely showed degeneration. Like specifically? They saw cartilage necrosis, mineralization, and disorganization. All signs of a disc that's in bad shape. Yeah, really bad shape. So everything was pointing to this disc being the problem. Uh-huh. But they didn't stop there, did they? No. They also looked at the spinal cord under the microscope. Right. What did that show? They saw damage to the spinal cord that was consistent with the compression. Uh -huh. Specifically, they found Wallerian degeneration. So the compression from the herniated disc 
was crushing the spinal cord and causing that Wallerian degeneration. Right. So the microscopic findings back up everything else they had seen. Yeah. This case really shows how IVDD can affect horses. Mm. It also shows how important those advanced imaging techniques are. Yeah. But it makes you wonder if they could have caught it sooner. That's a good question. Could they have changed the outcome for this horse? It's hard to say. Yeah. It really highlights the limitations we face when it comes to diagnosing IVDD in horses. Okay. You know those standing radiographs? Yeah. They're useful, but they don't always show those subtle changes in the discs early on. I see. Even with MRI, which gave us the most detailed images in this case, uh -huh. it's not always easy to get access to that. You can't just stick an adult horse in an MRI machine. Right, exactly. That makes early detection pretty tough. Yeah, it's a real challenge. So what are vets looking for? Whoa. What should make them think, hold on, this could be IVDD. Any signs of ataxia, okay. weakness, <laughs> pain in the neck or back. Like what this horse was showing? Right, but maybe at an earlier stage where it's not as obvious. More subtle. Yeah. But those signs could also mean other things, right? Oh yeah, definitely. So they would still need to do more tests to be sure. Absolutely. Okay, so let's say a vet thinks it could be IVDD based on the exam and some initial tests. Okay. What can they do to treat it? Treatment for IVDD in horses is constantly changing. Okay. And it really depends on how bad the herniation is and where it is. Makes sense. For less severe cases, yeah. conservative management is usually the first step. What does that involve? Usually rest, anti-inflammatory medications, okay. and maybe physical therapy to manage the pain and inflammation. How well does that work? It can help in some cases, okay. especially if there's not a lot of pressure on the spinal cord. I see. But even with conservative management, the outlook for IVDD is always uncertain. So it's not a guaranteed fix? No, not at all. What about surgery? Surgery is an option for more serious cases okay. where there's a lot of pressure on the spinal cord yeah. and conservative management hasn't been enough. What kind of surgery are we talking about? It could be a procedure called a ventral slot. Where they remove some bone to take the pressure off the spinal cord. Yeah. Or they might do a dorsal laminectomy. Which is where they remove part of the bony arch of the vertebra. That's right. Those sound pretty intense. They are. And like any surgery, there are risks. Oh, definitely. So it's not a decision they take lightly. No, it's a big decision that has to be made for each individual horse. Right. They have to consider the horse's overall health, yeah. how bad the condition is, uh, and the potential benefits and risks of surgery. And even with surgery, there's no guarantee the horse will be back to normal. Right. The success of surgery depends on a lot of things, okay. including how much damage has already been done to the spinal cord. So this case really shows us how complex and challenging equine IVDD can be. Yeah, it does. It also makes it clear that we need to keep doing research Absolutely. to learn more about this condition. I agree. I mean, we still don't fully understand what causes it right. or how common it is in different breeds. Yeah. And we need better ways to diagnose it early. That would make a huge difference. Imagine if we could catch it early. Yeah. Maybe we could prevent it from getting worse. Maybe we could even improve the outlook for these horses. That's the goal. This case, even though it's just one horse, yeah. really opens up a bigger discussion about IVDD in horses. I think so, too. It shows how important it is to think about the whole horse, uh -huh. your anatomy, how they move, how we diagnose and treat them. It all plays a role. It seems like we've just scratched the surface here. Yeah, there's a lot more to it. This deep dive has given us a lot to think about. Definitely. This was just one horse, though. Right. What can it tell us about how common IVDD is in horses in general? That's a good question. Yeah. And to be honest, we don't have all the answers yet. Really? Yeah, we're still trying to figure out just how prevalent IVDD is in horses overall. So we don't even know if it's a common problem. We think it's less common in horses compared to some other animals like dogs. Okay. But it's still a big concern. Why would it be less common in horses? Well, horses have a different anatomy and biomechanics than dogs. Okay. Their intervertebral discs are thicker and more fibrous. So that gives them more stability. Exactly. And their spines don't move as much as a dog's spine. Right. So their build kind of protects them from IVDD. In a way, yes. But they can still get it like we saw in this case. Yeah, unfortunately. That can really affect their movement and their whole well-being. Absolutely. It's a serious condition. Which is why we need to keep doing research. I agree. We need to learn more about what causes IVDD in horses so we can figure out how to prevent it. Yeah. And how to treat it better. Exactly. We need better strategies for both prevention and treatment. Thinking back on everything we've talked about today. Yeah. 
What are the key things our listeners should remember about IVDD in horses? I think the biggest takeaway is how important advanced imaging is for diagnosing this. Yeah. Like in this case, the CT myelography and MRI were crucial. They really showed the extent of the compression. Exactly. And they confirmed the diagnosis. And this case also showed how connected everything in the skine is. Yeah. That osteoarthritis in the horse's neck. Yeah. It makes you wonder if joint problems can lead to disc problems. That's a good point. So we have to look at the spine as a whole. I agree, not just the individual parts. And I think the last takeaway is that we still have a lot to learn about IVDD in horses. Definitely. There's so much we don't know uh, about what causes it yeah. and how common it is in different breeds. And we need better tools to catch it early. All of that is so important for improving outcomes for these horses. This has been a really interesting look at IVDD. It has. It really highlights the challenges vets face when diagnosing and managing this condition. Absolutely. Hopefully this deep dive will encourage more research on IVDD in horses. I hope so too. And lead to better outcomes for these amazing animals. That's the goal. That's the burning question. For sure. How can we improve our understanding and treatment of equine IVDD? A very important question. It's definitely something that needs more attention and exploration. I agree. Well, that wraps up our deep dive into equine IVDD. Great discussion. I hope everyone found it informative and insightful. Vet Neuro Jar. Keep those minds inspired, hearts light, and tails wagging.